Hello and welcome to this meeting on Tuesday the 29th of November. I'm Councillor Lee Scordis, Councillor for Old Heath and the Hive, and I'll be chairing this meeting of the Environment and Sustainability Panel tonight. Uh, the meeting is being held in the Grand Jury Room in the Town Hall in Colchester and is also being broadcast live over the internet where it can be watched via our Council's YouTube channel, where the recording will be available to view afterwards. Please would speakers use microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone. Action in the event of an emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening, so if an alarm does sound, please evacuate the town hall by going down the main staircase or the back staircase to the high street and then meeting at the car park behind the town hall in St. Ronald Street. Councillors and officers taking part in the meeting are requested to mute their microphones. Please activate, activate the microphone when invited to speak and turn the microphone off again when you finish speaking. Members of the committee may use electronic devices to access their meeting papers and visitors are welcome to use mobile phones and other devices, including cameras, but please use them discreetly, set them to silent and do not use voice or camera flash functions. Provisions in the constitution around the timings of breaks will apply to this meeting. So introductions. So I, I'm Councillor Lee Scordis, as I've already said, and I will go to my right uh, for introductions. Um, Matthew Evans, Democratic Services Officer. Darius Laws, Rural Ward North, substituting this evening for Councillor Sue Lissimore. Andrew Ellis, Mark Tay, Air Ward. Councillor Molly Bloomfield, Greenstead Wards. Lewis Barber, Lexton, Braswick Ward, substituting for Councillor William Summix. Ben Plummer, Climate Emergency Officer. Emily Harrop, Transport and Sustainability Project Lead. Richard Kirkby Taylor, Castle Ward. Councillor Kayleigh Rippingale, New Trown and Christchurch Ward. Councillor Michelle Burrows, Wivenhoe Ward. Councillor Tracy Arnold, Stanway Ward. Mandy Jones, Assistant Director, Place and Client Services. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. We also have Rosie, who's online as well and may come in for some questions. Um, Okay, so uh, substitution. So Councillor Barber is subbing for Councillor Sunnox and Councillor Laws is subbing for Councillor Lismore. Any other subs? I recognise all your other faces, so I believe that's all. Um, item three, urgent items. We have no urgent items. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Yes, Councillor Burrows. I have a non-pecuniary interest to declare as an item seven it mentions culture arts center and i'm on the culture arts center board thank you very much i believe that's all the declarations of interest brilliant uh so item five minutes of the previous meetings um any comments on these at the moment nope everyone's happy good stuff um i'll sign them after the meeting uh so item six have your say uh, just the one speaker tonight, and that is Mr. Rick Andrew. Uh, so if you'd like to come to the microphone, please. So you'll have uh, three minutes to speak on two minutes of bell will sound just to warn you of the minute, and then you'll have a minute to respond after. Thank you. Um, as I'm sure this panel is aware, 90% of our airborne pollutants come from vehicle exhausts. My concern, however, is not distant global problems like climate emergency, energy crisis, obesity epidemic, but Colchester's chronic con traffic congestion, which is very much our problem and something about which we should, can and should do a lot more than the minor mitigation measures this panel is discussing. Gridlock actually happened last week as a direct result, and it's a direct result of, you know, Colchester's car centric policies over the years. Ed of town retail parts with free parking encourage driving in a the high street which badly needs urgent redesign so the future transport strategy is all very well encouraging but when will we actually quote transform colchester to be active safe and sustainable unquote elsewhere things are happening much more rapidly or have happened cambridge north newtown has been designed around a smart new railway station on the existing main line. Why not a new station at Colchester East serving 10, 10 brings new town? A bus is a bus, it's not a rapid transport system, transit system. Why not trams running on underused existing rail tracks into St. Botox, avoiding the traffic? 
an option Jacobs, Ringway Jacobs failed to consider. Crouch Street is a vital part of the new east-west cycle route. It must be high quality and designed for high cycle flows. Yet the recent decision to go for option 2A is neither. The cycle lane will not be wide enough and there'll be no public realm gain because there'll be car parking on both sides. Why? Is 15 car park spaces not enough? I think it's plenty. And the last thing, finally the last thing we need is a new link road, which is guaranteed to generate more traffic. So you know, this is not thinking differently, is it? Really? The only way to generate improve air quality is to reduce traffic which is you know, a stated aim of Essex, Colchester and, and so on. But when are we going to do to do that? Do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. And this is something I've raised before many times since being elected. Um, where we do come a cropper is much of this comes under Essex County Council uh, rather than the City Council. And that relationship hasn't always been good. Um, and you only have to look at some of the issues that we've had. Um, and I agree with you on Crouch Street. And unfortunately, our very rather myopic MP opposed the changes and went with the populist argument. Um, and that's really disappointing because we have gone for the poorer option. Um, but there is some good news with the East West, uh, the, the East Link, which does look good if we get funding, um, which is going to improve hopefully that. Um, but you are right, we need to do more over public transport. Um, we are looking at rubbish, a rapid transport system, but again, that will all depend on funding. And we are at a stage where councils are rapidly running out of money. Um, I don't know if officers want to add anything to that. Um, what Mr. Andrew said, I think they're all pertinent points. It's just, un unfortunately, a lot of it's out of our remit. Otherwise, we'd like to do a lot more and tell you that. Yeah, please do, Mandy. Okay. Um, I, I think there's, um, aside from that, there are a few other um, uh, areas of work that are going on that will support active travel going forward and the building of that infrastructure. Particularly one of them is the master planning work that's happening in the city centre at the moment. Um, uh, that commission will be finished at the end of December and um, that we'll be working through a process to have a draft for that for the public in the new year at some point, but that will include um, a future transport plan. And we've been working with colleagues at Essex as well to look at how that needs to look in, in the form of a vision and an illustrative master plan for the town centre. So thinking through how that transport works. There are several other schemes in the offing that I know of at the moment. Um, in the active travel fund, I always get this wrong, whether it's two or three, I think it's two. Um, and although I'm not an expert in the transport sphere, I know that part of St Nicholas Square includes a cycle route, so the scheme there includes a cycle route, and as does um, physical connectivity in our new town deal work, which is about a link between Greenstead and the town centre, so there'll be a two way cycle route up and down um, East Hill, so that will hopefully connect up the East and the West towards Kraus, Trout Street more as well. So there is there is work underway to, to look at that and how that needs to be placed going forward. And Councillor Burrows. Thank you. I know also that Essex Highways are trying to engage members of the public with their cultures of walking and cycling um, to input into those big plans. I have shared that, but I will share that again on Wyvern Home pages so you can have a look and input onto that. Councillor Barber, are you coming in as your role as a deputy? Uh, yeah, I should, I'll make a couple of points. I'll disclose the fact that I'm a deputy cabinet member for Highways at Essex County Council. Um, you're, you're right on what we want to see in the, in the town centre. It's very much, obviously, improvements in cycle and walking. One of the biggest challenges is identifying funding. But one of the schemes that we're bringing forward at Essex, um, to having discussed it with colleagues at Colchester, is the route down East Hill. Uh, Connecting into the centre of the of the borough, so I think it, there is some really exciting projects being brought forward. A lot of it is funding dependent, and we do rely on external source of funding just because of the cost of it. Um, but it, it's certainly very much top of the agenda in respect to the discussions we've been having between Culture Borough Council and Essex County Council and the master planning. A big chunk of the focus, not all the focus, but a big chunk of the focus, is on revolutionising our transport strategy and realising 
to really drive up footfall in the town centre, we need to find new ways to get people into the town centre and travelling. So I completely agree with you uh, from the perspective on we need to do more. And I certainly think, and I, having shared the room with a number of colleagues here, there's definitely the ambition to do more. A lot of it, unfortunately, does come down to funding, but we want to keep pushing as far as we can to increase options for people, more more sustainable transport, um, as well as public public transport provision, as well as the active travel work. But, uh, I, f I fully agree with the comments you make about doing more as well. Well, you've you got a minute to come back, so go for it. Right, microphone. Thank you. A lot of it's all in the future, and I do think we need to be more concerned about gridlock now. I was stuck in it on a very rare car journey to the garage for an hour, which is, and it's just ludicrous. But I also mentioned the possibility of the new railway station on the existing railway line, which Cambridge North did with their new town, and it, they made the station very much new station very much an integral part of the new town. That doesn't seem to have been considered as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong. And I cannot understand how uh, a new road um, linking the 120 and the 133 can do anything other than generate more traffic when what we need is less traffic. That's the stated aims and the only way to, to improve air quality, really. Thanks. So, so I think in the early stages, a train station was considered and they even considered moving Hive Station from where it is to close well, to the I university. Meant, I mean, on the existing railway line, I meant not sort of shore, shore farm sort of area. Um, so I think there were discussions of that, and I think either funding came afoul or, or upsetting people. Um, but this was a this was quite a long time ago. I mean, this was this was about six years ago, mm. um, but nothing really came of it at the time. So I think sadly that fell, that did fall flat. But you do raise a good point. You know, we do need more mm. stations. Yes. And being honest, where Colchester train station is isn't in the perfect place. Um, you can read the history around that. It was a yeah, bit of NIMBYism. They didn't it want is. it in the town centre. Yeah. Um, so there are issues of that and you do raise some really pertinent points but i think there is some good stuff coming forward there's been some really good success with the uh, e-scooters when they're on the road not when they're on the pavement but they they are they are being used and they are getting people and that the kind of fad of using them for a laugh seems to have disappeared people are using mm. them who generally want to use them every day to get short journeys so there are some successes. It's always harder in winter because it's colder, it's wetter, it's windier, um, and not everyone gets lights for their bike and they don't feel as safe. So no. there, are, there are always those challenges, but there's always more we can do as well. Okay, just on the funding, I mean, in my previous experience, if you aim high and big, 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 you sometimes get 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 the money with a bit more visionary schemes. Can we not revisit the the station the possible station uh, scheme and can we not revisit the, the new need for a, re, a new link road or at least defer it until we've got some genuine alternatives in place it is well councillor ellis is saying it's no uh, but we can get you a written answer from the cabinet member and see if that is possible um because you've given up your evening tonight so it's important we get you a proper answer there thank you uh, councillor ellis sorry I, I wasn't being flippant with the no um chairman the fact is um if you look at what happened in Chumpsford, I think it took, it's taken something like 20 years for them to get a railway station way over budget um, for their new, wasn't a new town, but new development, um, Bewley. The, um, a, a railway station was discussed very early on. One of the campaign groups actually put forward the idea of, of developing along the railway line and having a railway station, um, but it would have made the scheme unviable, I think, at the time. Um, when they were looking at the one to the east, um, I have another look at that, but I think that was the reasoning. I can see Mandy shaking her head. The Mark's Tay one was definitely um, was one that we looked at, but going east, I think that was the um, that was one of the issues with it. Um, but no, I wasn't I wasn't being flippant. Um, and and also as far as the link road is concerned, I think that's all funding dependent. I don't know if that's sorted now, Mandy, or not sorted now. No, she's shaking her head. Um, I'm not sure about that one. I'll have to get back to you on the link road issues, but um, Karen Syrett would be the person to, to get in touch with around that. So I'll ask her. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. Okay, yep, yeah, so we'll get you an answer. Thanks for coming Thank tonight. You. You're welcome to stay, or you're welcome to get back in time for England Wales. So.
<laughs> right. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. So that takes us to item seven. Uh, so I'm inviting Ben to introduce this item. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so this item um, is all to do with the council's emissions, essentially. Um, so the report sets out um, a breakdown of the council's emissions for uh, financial year 21-22 um, and shows how that's broken down by different areas in terms of sort of our gas and electricity consumption, uh, emissions from our fleet, staff commuting, staff business travel, and water and waste from our buildings as well. Um, and then goes on to uh, talk about how we're aiming to address some of those emissions. Um, emissions to do with our buildings. Um, so we've been recently doing a bit of work with a consultancy called Ingleton Wood, uh, where they've been involved in doing some uh, site surveys of seven um, buildings, one of which is Colchester Arts Centre, which is a building that the council leases out to the Arts Centre. All the other buildings listed on the report are ones that we own and operate um, ourselves. And, and what they've been doing is, yes, they've been doing these um, site surveys looking to identify measures to improve the energy efficiency within those properties or um, install lower carbon um, heating systems within those properties. Um, and the process we're at with it now is we're just receiving the what's called heat decarbonisation plans for each of those buildings, which essentially is sort of just sort of lays out um, the current status of each building, the condition of each building and how it's heated and um, how energy is provided currently and then provides a set of options that could be considered putting into those buildings to help decarbonize and increase energy efficiency. Um, so it lays out various sort of um, uh, things to consider within those. So it lays out the, obviously the costs of um, buying the parts in the first place, the operational costs of running um, with each of the different measures, and also lays out the cost savings because a lot of the um, environmental improvements that can be made to these buildings produce cost savings for the council. Um, so where we're at is basically we've got these reports um, and we're just going through them at the at the moment um, to see what we think is sort of a priority and what things are going to take longer to consider there's going to be sort of multiple complexities within um, some of these buildings um, which means that some of them won't be able to be worked on straight away um, and obviously we've got budgets uh, is one of the key sort of consideration um, where we can get funding from to do a lot of these works. But what we've I've said at the end of the document is that we'd like to bring a report back to the panel in the new year once we've um, assessed all of the plans and a sort of we've sort of analysed what we think are priorities that we'd like to do um, short and long term, um, and then get feedback um, from councillors then about some of those some of those ideas but um so this just sort of lays out the process so i'm happy to sort of take questions on on the process and anything about that um now or anything to do with the council's emissions that i laid out um previously thank you ben any questions on this one on the process is everyone content with how we're doing it cool okay brilliant well thank you ben I'm looking forward to Colchester Castle having solar panels and insulation. Right, so this takes us to item number eight, uh, which is the DEFRA air quality project update. And Emily is going to update us on this one. Thank you, Chair. We've done um, a presentation to go with the report because it's always nice to have some visuals um, because our project has a lot of imagery that goes with it. Okay, so thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come and update you on our DEFRA funded projects to tackle poor air quality. Next slide, please. I thought I'd just start off with giving a bit of national and local context. So air Pollution contributes to 36,000 deaths in the UK every year, and that costs the NHS 157 million. On a local level, we've got three air quality management areas in Colchester and Public Health England um, documents that one in 20 deaths in Colchester are linked to poor air quality. And unfortunately, it's many of our um, disadvantaged communities that are most affected by poor air quality. Next slide, please. 
So I thought it'd be useful to recap on the air quality management area and Belinda's going to talk about that. Hello, I'm um, Belinda Silkstone. I'm Environmental Protection Manager here at Colchester and air quality fits within my remit. Um, monitoring of air quality. So um, within Colchester, we have about 65 diffusion tubes measuring the pollutant nitrogen dioxide at various points um, across the borough. Um, we also have a continuous monitoring station in Brook Street, and I should be near and, and be able to point out where Brook Street is, but I, I, I might be doing a minute. Um, a continuous monitoring station there. Um, and we also produce a report annually for DEFRA, um, an annual status report. And this um, includes all the council's monitoring data, um, any development that's happening in the borough or city, um, and yeah, all our results and all our actions that we're taking against our air quality action plan. So that gets submitted to DEFRA and, and they appraise it. You know, they tell us whether they approve what we're doing in the, in the city for air quality. So air quality is very much governed centrally um, across, across the UK. Um, so in Colchester, we do have air quality management areas. And I thought it would be really important to show you these because actually, Everything that's been done with the DEFRA grant bids and all the work that's come on is because we've had air quality management areas um, within the city. Because we have air quality management areas, we have to produce an air quality action plan. So again, our bids that we've made link to the air quality action plan. Although we're not the highways authority, so we can't influence um, infrastructure, we can influence behaviour change and a lot of the work that Emily's going to describe is all about behaviour change and what, what we've done um, to improve air quality. So in Colchester, we always say air quality is generally improving, but a few hot spots remain. So I am going to get out now because it's probably easier to point out where they are. So this is our high street. Um, in Head Street, Long Hill, High Street, um, that's Merton Road, and the back there is Brook Street. Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry. So that there is um, Mersey Road was first declared an air quality management area in 2003, so quite some time ago. Brook Street was 2005. So again, you know, we're talking some time. The Central Corridors Air Quality Management Area, some might remember this, was about 13, 14. At the time, the administration wanted an air quality management area that wasn't a big circle. They wanted something where every property within it had a reason for being in it. So either air quality modeling or diffusion tube data which showed that they were exceeding the pollution level of 40 micrograms um, they were in there. So this is what we looked at. This is what the borough looked like 2014. Actually, it was amended in 1617 and we lost air quality management area three. But now where we are today is in 2021, we only had exceedances here in Osborne Street, here in Mersey Road and the top end of Brook Street or the bottom end, depending on what you look at. Um, so air quality is improving, um, but these hot spots remain, and it probably is fitting that actually Mersey Road will be the last to go because it was the first to come. So I think it's really important to see it is improving. Um, and the importance of having those declared air quality management areas because um, we've been able to build on them with the projects and all the work that you're going to see coming coming on so that's me <laughs> next, next slide please so um, we received our first funding from DEFRA in 2019 and since then um, in total we've had four successful bids which have brought in over 746,000 pounds worth of funding towards behavior change projects we've also submitted a fifth bid to DEFRA that we're waiting the outcome of for further 310,000. Um, one of the reasons we think we've been successful with our bids to DEFRA is because we very much take an asset-based community development approach to tackling pollution. 
This means that we work with the community um, as much as possible to co-design solutions in our campaigns. And it's very much an educational approach. Um, um, we really recognise that education and community buy-in is the most successful way of achieving long-term behaviour change. Also, when it comes to a legacy and being able to, for the work to continue once the funding has dried up, it's really important that it's, imbe it's embedded within the community and that they have ownership of it. So we've been able to evidence through our projects so far that um, improve um, awareness of uh, air pollution and its impact on health has been improved. Um, and as uh, Belinda says, there's now evidence as well of um, that air pollution is improving, or reducing. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to cover today the projects that are mainly around our um, campaigns to uh, encourage people to switch off their engine um, when they're waiting. Uh, we're going to be coming back in January to report and ask update on the more active travel um, and behavior change projects such as the cargo bikes car club etc next slide please so i'll start off with our roadside signage project um, so this was a project to look at how psychological behavior change messages could be used in road signage the signage was undertaken in partnership with the university of essex and we were aimed explore the impact of road signage on the number of um, drivers switching off their engines. The messages that we wanted to use were grounded in different psychological approaches to social influence. Um, and these had already been identified and proven as to be successful in short term trials undertaken by the University of East Anglia and the University of Kent. But what we wanted to do with our project was to really look at it over a long term and see whether those sort of um, changes were sustained over a longer period of time. So we looked at a number of different approaches. Um, the first study looked at um, testing the three messages to see what was the most effective um, and to see whether the effects continued once the signs were removed. The second study explored whether by rotating the signs every three weeks, whether that had a bigger impact on the number of drivers that switched off their engine. And then the third study was more of a long term study to see if the signs were left over a long period of time, whether drivers drive, um, got fatigue from looking at the signs and whether the number of engine switch offs dropped off a period of time because they'd seen the signs too regularly. So the signs went up in three locations. It was Eastgate's level crossing and then the north and south side of Brook Street. Um, and the, t the studies were undertaken between February 21 and September 22. And during that time, we collected data from over 150,000 vehicles using our research assistants um, on a frequent basis, counting the number of engines being switched off. Next slide, please. So from all the evidence and data that we collected, uh, there was a definite confirmation that the presence of the signs resulted in an increase in the numbers of drivers switching off. So it, it did vary depending on weather conditions and the time of the day, but the peak average was a switch off rate of 26%. And from our baseline data, that was an 11% increase of drivers switching off their engine. To put it in a bit of context at Eastgates, that was approximately 260 vehicles, extra vehicles a week switching off their engine. And we're estimating that's a saving of about 91 grams of nitrogen dioxide a week in the air. So Colchester is um, the only long term study of the effectiveness of no idling signage in the UK. And what's interesting is when we compare our results against the shorter term studies that were only four to six weeks in Norwich and Canterbury, there are similar results, um, particularly around the percentage of switch offs and also in terms of which message performed the strongest, which was the social norms message. So our recommendation is that we put signage up permanently in Brook Street and Eastgates, and that we also explore other areas of the AQMA, whether there's a high number of residents to put additional signage. Next slide, please. So our main conclusions that we drew is that signage is a cost effective and low maintenance measure. Um, the, the best performing study was when the signs were up long term and it was the same sign. And for our study, we found that the social norm, which is the same as the other studies, was the strongest performing message. Uh, join other responsible drivers in Colchester, turn off your engine when the traffic lights are red or the barriers are down. We also introduced a fourth message, which hadn't been tested before, which is the health threat alleviation message. And the reason we tried this one was because when we carried out our initial community 
engagement for the careless pollution campaign um, the community said that the threat to their personal health was the biggest motivator for them to, to um, consider switching off their engine so we tested this new message exhaust fumes build up in your car while you wait switch off your engine protect your health and that was also a very successful message next slide please so moving on to careless pollution um, we have been over the last year undertaking phase two of this project which which again is encouraging the community to switch off the engine when they wait um, we've been um, the, the focus of phase two was really on a peer-to-peer -peer approach um, and we developed a film which we were hoping to show but sorry we haven't added the link we'll share it afterwards um, which features local people um, using the materials that we've developed as a bit of a support to businesses um, schools and residents in in what materials are available and how best to use them really to help give them support along with a fact sheet to um, be influencing their colleagues their families their friends We've also started work on uh, working with delivery drivers, as we know that's um, been an issue that's been raised by members previously. Um, we've spoken to a number of local uh, cafes and restaurants, but we've had a really good meeting recently with Deliveroo, who are really keen to work with us um, as part of their sustainability agenda on initially um, encouraging drivers to switch off their engines, but then um, also working with us on the active travel side and seeing if we can convert some of the drivers onto e-bikes and uh, cargo bikes, etc. Next slide, please. Um, the results that we had after the first 12 months were for phase one of careless pollution, but it, but it clearly um, evidenced that 56% um, of drivers were switching off their engines more than they were previously and 65% outside schools. The evaluation for phase two starts in um, January um, and we'll be putting our final report together by June, um, at which time we'd be happy to come back and share the results in more detail of, of phase two of the campaign. Next slide, please. Another project we delivered last winter uh, was to raise awareness of the health impacts of smoke from home fires and log burners. Um, and this was particularly to focus on particular matter and the dangers to health of that. We targeted Castle and Christchurch Ward partly because they um, are in and border the AQMA, but also because from the research we did um, and evidence from the fire services, those wards had the highest number of people using their fires. Um, we, again, we wanted to take an educational approach. We didn't want to tell people not to burn, but we wanted to people to burn more responsibly and be more aware of the consequences on their health. Um, so we developed some uh, marketing materials uh, uh, with some key messages. Next slide, please. So we uh, mosaic profiled um, the, the communities that had uh, fires. And from that, we worked out where best we needed to locate ourselves in order to reach them with our messaging. So we um, carried out 10 home burning events over five locations, which included Phoenix and um, First Sight and the library and had over 900 face to face conversations. When we did our um, after the campaign polls at the locations that we'd um, promoted it at, we had a 19% increase in awareness of the um, impact of, of burning on health. We're rerunning the campaign this Christmas, but we're also taking um, do, having another angle to it in that we're working with community partners because we understand that a number of people are considering opening their fires as a consequence of the fuel crisis as a sort of cheap or free way to um, heat their homes. And obviously we want them to be aware of the dangers um, of this. So we're, we're, that requires slightly different um, messaging, which we're currently developing. Next slide, please. Throughout our project delivery, we've been very conscious of the legacy and which is why we've really wanted to embed this project into the community. So part of the legacy we're looking at is some community art projects and we've identified a local artist who's going to work with us on that to sort of explore how we can put some messages within the streetscape a sort of a semi permanent permanent reminder. Um, we're looking at the potential for murals and we're exploring um, a number of different locations. We've been working with Clean Air Colchester throughout the project um, as the, the sort of voluntary group that can uh, continue this work once our project is finished. Um, this year they've uh, gone under uh, NFORM as an umbrella organisation to support them, which means that that will give them access to um, be able to apply for funding and, and 
provide support. Their volunteer base is growing um, and we're pushing as much of our resources as possible through their website now, because obviously that will be the ongoing resource for the community. Uh, we're also pleased that um, as part, DEFRA expect us to share knowledge, but we have been approached by a lot of councils wanting to know more about our approach and why, why we've done things the way we have and also asking whether they can share our resources as well. Um, we're also working closely with a number of different health organisations. Next slide, please. Just a little bit on the new DEFRA bid. Um, when it came to putting this bid together, we really looked at everything that we'd done over the last few years and what's coming up. And we really wanted to look at what could support the new infrastructure that's coming forward through, through the town deal, levelling up active travel fund, etc. Over the summer, we spoke to lots of people at events to find out what it was that they were missing that would help them make the change from being reliant on cars to more walking and cycling. So this new DEFRA bid is really about filling the gaps um, and a sort of co-design approach with businesses, schools and residents to fill those gaps with to make sure that whatever we develop is appropriate and relevant, relevant to them to um, initiate the behaviour change. And our focus will be on journeys of up to three miles from the town centre, as that's a sort of practical distance for people, particularly to cycle. Next slide, please. So just a few points in summary, really. Um, hopefully we've shown how we've taken a real evidence based approach to our projects um, and sort of the importance of that monitoring and evaluation to feed into the continual review and development and taking forward of our projects with the community. Um, I think the advice. The the fact that we've, we other councils seek our advice sort of shows that our approach that's very much community based is really relevant and of interest to other people. And what's really essential um, in all our projects is really the relationship building side and in, um, really developing those relationships with the community. I think that's where obviously members can really help us. So hopefully it's given you a bit of insight into what we're doing. And um, if, there, if you've got any communities that we haven't accessed that you can help us communicate with them would really welcome your support in that thank you that's it brilliant thank you very much okay uh any questions on that really interesting piece of work councillor bloomfield um so i noticed you discussed about working with um delivery and other businesses like kimchi house etc um, so I used to work at Wagamama, like a few doors up, and um, the the drivers would idle their engines. I think part of the problem was that occasionally when there were um, police or parking wardens around, they would get fined if they were there for too long. And I wonder whether when your um when your team is is working with delivery and these other businesses part of the conversation should be do the drivers have a a place where they can actually park and they feel like they can put their vehicle there for a decent amount of time because sometimes the food isn't prepared very quickly um so i don't know whether it's worth kind of speaking to licensing or highways about that because also people working in the gig economy shouldn't be fined anyway for parking outside a restaurant thank you yeah and no, i think they're really good points i think um it was quite interesting the conversation with delivery and we talked to them about whether we could explore why drivers leave their engine on and which would obviously give us the evidence then that perhaps that is one of the reasons um whether they think if they leave the engine on they won't get fined because it indicates that they're kind of about to go so i think it'd be really useful for us to understand a bit more about the idling behavior and then what we do is then tailor our messaging um, to address those issues i think the challenge with finding somewhere for them to park is that then means there's a walk and obviously most people want to park on the doorstep don't they because they want to be getting away quickly so i think there's probably quite a few challenges but i think the I think what would be really good is if we we've, now we've got that dialogue with Deliveroo, um, they can really target um, even individual streets so they could they can contact and communicate with the specific drivers that work within our AQMA and pick up from the areas there. So it gives us the opportunity to really do some sort of more bespoke work with a, on a really targeted basis. 
Um, but yeah, I think we need to explore those things with them. So I've got Councillor Laws. Thanks. Uh, Emily Blinder, thank you for that presentation. You're clearly doing excellent work. I know you have been doing so for a long time on idling in particular. I wanted to um, kind of drill into this delivery point a bit. And I, I, I say take a different tack to what we just heard because I don't want to see the cars there. I, I, and I appreciate people don't want coal chips. Who does, right? But actually, um, the, part, part of the problem here is that the, the, the big bulky cars are, are engine idling, they're mounting the pavements, they're ca causing distress to people walking prams, people that have got mobility issues, they give anxiety to me as an able-bodied person, just because I know they're going to zoom off um, quite, quite regularly. Um, I just wondered what the kind of, what was happening elsewhere in the country with this? I mean, is this, is this culture to unique? I guess not, but I wondered, was there any good examples of what's working well elsewhere and you know is delivery open to ideas for example like when you pay your energy bill you have an option to pay for a green option which means that you know that person is paying for an e-cargo bike solution that's maybe got a heated facility on the bike so your food still comes warm but but for 50p extra you're avoiding someone using a frankly quite often a knackered car that's polluting the high street so that was something that came to mind um, and also, I just wondered if we do have any kind of gift to consider a, a bit of a, a bit of a stick approach, actually, with the car drivers. You know, I mean, can we, as an authority, consider um, a levy to say we do not want, you know, 15, 20 year old Mondeos mounting North Station um, pavement in the evening to pick up a bag of chips and a kebab when actually you, you could eat cargo it if you're going to go to most of the suburban streets around here. I mean, I've got here tonight in 20 minutes from several. It's quicker than driving a car on a bike. But my chips would have been cold because I don't have a facility <laughs> to house them in. Um, so I get the practical things from both the customer uh, and the, the gig economy and respect to the guys that are out there all hours, you know, earning a living. But we've got to find a way of making the experience nicer for everyone who wants to enjoy Colchester. Because I find it anxiety inducing at the moment. You know, it's not a nice experience. I know it's a soft feely thing, but we all we're all signed up to making this place feel uh, and, and smell better and be safer. I just wondered um, what kind of conversations are being had. Sorry, there's a bit of a monologue there, isn't there? I don't know about sort of other places. I think we're just beginning to explore the whole delivery driver side of things. So I think that's some research for us to do in terms of whether there's any good examples elsewhere. Um, it was interesting talk, talking to Deliveroo that the engine idling wasn't really a thing that they'd thought about before and they found it really interesting. So they seem to be willing to do some work with us on that, both to explore why it happens and to put information into their guidance about why it shouldn't be done. Um, we did talk to them about the educational versus the punitive approach. I mean, again, they were supportive of the educational approach given we've got low paid workers, etc. So. I think there's lots of scope to explore it further, um, and this is just the beginning. Um, we would very much like to see more of them out of cars and on cargo bikes. Uh, we talked a bit about that, and they talked about the, the distance and how their algorithm sort of selects the most appropriate person depending on the distance of the delivery. Um, but I guess if we can break down myths around keeping things warm and distance, um, you know, there's potential there. But they certainly seemed interested, so I think it's, you know, the beginning of but it felt like it could become a positive relationship um, and then if we've got you know if we can do some more delivery hopefully that would help us influence some of the other um uber eats and the other providers of fast food um i was just going to come back on that i think there's some really interesting points about uh, delivery drivers and that being an issue um one of the things i think from defa is that education has so far been the way that they've gone with this and particularly around the behavioural insights and behaviour change approach that actually using um, trusted ways of um, communicating with people is, is, is really given you know great results which I think has been shown in, in Emily's presentation with some of the stats that she's got there. Um, I, I think this is also a really good example Emily of the communities can approach and working with partners and trying to get that community ownership in quite early and I think the the this has really helped raise awareness particularly in young people and schools of um idling and and its importance um I was just going to say I, 
I think that there is a, an assessment going on about what other authorities have done in relation to, you know, the, the stick approach, if you like, and enforcement, um, and the impact of that, looking at it. Most authorities who, who have done it have felt that it hasn't worked effectively as a, as a um, measure. It hasn't had the impact that it was expected to have. However, I think we need to probably just have a look at it ourselves and think about, you know, how it works. Um, there are costs obviously to that and and it, it you know it's a it's a it's quite a big cost to be able to do that and against something where we've got DEFRA funding it might be best to go down that route in terms of education if the impact is going to be you know proven and much more successful um I just wanted to also say that this is uh, Emily and the team do hide their light under a bushel a bit and this is really really good work and actually is um, is celebrated throughout the country. Emily has been asked to, to uh, present at many, many conferences, Essex Climate Commission, and is seen as a, a leading um, light in the industry. So I just wanted to say that because I know she does hide her light under a bushel. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a, it's, there's some really brilliant points and I think it's something that we can all take away and think about. But this work on behavioural insights and behaviour change is cutting edge and it supports a lot of the work on master planning infrastructure walking and cycling throughout the borough car clubs etc etc um, and it's really about that people bit working with people on it so um yeah sorry just wanted to get that in there okay i thought councillor barber arnold and rippingale so councillor barber first thank you very much and thank you all, all of you for your uh, presentation on this and, and comments after uh, well firstly hugely congratulations because clearly the repeated funding and the size of the funding is considerable so you're doing an amazing work and long may that continue uh, I, th I think just personally listening to that is an absolutely fascinating piece of work there's uh, psychology behind it and it's really good collaboration with the university of essex which I know we've spoken about in the council deepening those ties and I think this is a really good example of that working. Um, I, I would be interested just on the signs because when I've tried to do this in my own ward about parking on bicycles on the zigzag lines and don't park here those sort of signs one of the issues was about sort of sanitization of message that you see it and you just get used to it and start to ignore it. Is that something that's being considered when looking at, at the signs longer term? Um, I mean it, it's, it's fascinating because Generally, even, you know, I'm sure cars don't think really of sh turning off our engines unless prompted. I've seen the sign on the North Station Bridge um, when, I, when I pass through there, usually on my bike using the bike lane, might I add, um, which is a brilliant bike lane. Um, but I would, um, I, I think that it's really good to have as many of these as the funding can allow because it's just something most people won't think about, like you said, until prompted. But I'd be interested in some of the longer term thinking if that's been looked into at all. That was the study three that we did, so that the signs were up for nine months, and yeah. that's where we really wanted to explore whether the the whether the turnoffs dropped off because the signs because people got bored of seeing the signs. But um, the evidence didn't show that; it showed it was sustained. Um, so yeah, our conclusion was that the that having signs long term would have a benefit. I think um, obviously these signs are based on psychological messaging, and I don't know what the signs were around the schools but sort of just the evidence shows that if you just say switch off your engine that doesn't have any effect it needs to be something either the self-efficacy or the, well, the social norms was the the success one and the, and the health alleviation threat alleviation so the thing that makes people think about their own actions um, or want to be like others so the actual message itself is also a really important part of it and how you phrase that message just very quickly, that one in 20 figure is extraordinary. And I think the more we publish that, I mean, that is quite startling, really. Because you think of the sort of air pollution as a, in a, a big city problem, effectively, but that is dramatic, actually. It's much higher than I thought. So if we can plaster that everywhere as well. Councillor Arnold. Yes, thank you, Emily, for your presentation. Um, it was quite interesting to see on your map Colchester that I walk here 90% on the red route and I always end up using my inhaler by the time I get to the town hall which is quite scary. Um, it would be lovely to know is there any way we with this um, educational studies we're doing and trying to educate people about idling are we running any other studies alongside that like uh, plants that are well known for absorbing carbon in the high you know tense areas? 
Um, we're not at the moment. It's mainly around um, encouraging people to switch off their engine and trying to encourage people out of their cars. Um, uh, um, the DEFRA applications have always been quite precise, actually, on what we can bid for. Um, and Emily and I can tell we 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 tend to go for what they're what's in vogue and what they're looking for. And they've always said about reducing emissions at source. They're not keen on anything that absorbs pollution afterwards. So um, because these projects have have been put in to get money, basically, um, we tended to go on, go on with things that reduce pollution at source um, and not looked at the kind of carbon absorbing. Um, things you know I've, I've seen that yeah and then I've got Councillor Rippingham so representing one of these boards that's very very much in your air quality management zones and having um, spent some time with the wonderful Rosie understanding about the project and um, for me, I what I've noticed living in that in the area as well that the signs are like placed at like traffic lights, whereas actually I wonder if there's scope to extend the project so it's further down the road as well, because what you'll find is that the Brook Street crossroads is that Magdalen Street is often very blocked, but people further down the road obviously don't see the signs until they get to the cross to the lights so I wondered I know Rosie's been doing some wonderful work around like murals and hence why we've ended up connected um which is a really unique way of sort of encouraging people to turn off their engines but I'm just wondering with the standard signage if there's scope to have it further down the road and all of those entry points into particularly the Brook Street Magdalene Street crossroads because I think that you'll find people further down the road may start to turn off their engines when they're in clogged areas, especially around peak travel times. We can look at um, where we put the signs. I mean, that would be the next step as to where obviously they need to be in their quality management area. And we also want to focus on where there's a lot of residents or lots of people walking past. Our main constraint with where we put the signs is what we can put them on. Um, the load bearings of its very technical lamp posts. Um, so we were quite restricted even for this study as to where we could actually put the signs and weren't necessarily in our absolutely ideal locations because that wasn't an option. But we can definitely explore that uh, when we look at where else we put the signs. Um, and consider that. We, we also do want to be wary of, of, the, of the aesthetics of streets as well, because once you're putting too many signs up, it well, it looks a bit like uh, Long Wire Street did when we had all the A boards, so it doesn't doesn't always look the nicest, less of a hazard, but still. Uh, Councillor Bloomfield. Um, I just had another idea in terms of speaking with businesses. Um, so I run my park play in my ward uh, on a Saturday morning. And what happens is um, when it's hot, we get a ice cream van who comes there and sits there for between 15 minutes and an hour. Um, and the engine is constantly running the whole time that they're there. Um, and my worry is that the pollution is really bad in, in the park where there are a lot of children. Um, I briefly Googled this and um, I think Sheffield Council had looked into um, trying to encourage ice cream vans to uh, invest in vehicles where they don't have to have the engine running in order to serve the ice cream. Um, yeah. Interesting to know if that technology exists. It's, um, it would be a good one to encourage our ice cream vans to do. I mean, that kind of you know the conversations where it would be great if if anyone has an observation of that sort that they can actually go and have a chat with them and just find out you know have they ever considered it is it an issue and even if i've always wondered with ice cream bands whether they even need to leave their engine on all of the time is it absolutely necessary or is it just a habit like everything else that it just gets left on mm, it could be zero refrigeration um but again 
you know, all of our resources and materials, anyone is welcome to use them to have any of those conversations with anyone they notice. Obviously, it will only work if everyone gets involved in spreading the message, which is our sort of peer-to-peer -peer approach. Thank you. Any other questions for Emily Belinda? I see Councillor Burris. It wasn't a question. I just wanted to back up what everybody else has said. I think it's a really fascinating report and obviously lots of work's gone into it and I really appreciate that. I've shared the um, video that you had on the Culture website. It's brilliant. So I think that's a really easy thing we can all do. And we can, if we did that once every couple of weeks, we reach lots and lots of people and we share it on all our, like for example, the Wivenhoe um, Facebook page. We've all got Facebook pages, haven't you? We? we can just keep doing that and that and that. Thank you. Um, I'm just, just going to come back on the um, question about the greening because I think it is a really interesting one around uh, trees, etc. I think um, we did have a conversation around this and actually where the air quality management areas are, there isn't a huge amount of opportunity to put in trees if you think of Brook Street and the highways and the pavements that are there, the impact that you'd get and where you could plant a tree is probably not where you'd want that impact to be. Um, for the amount of carbon that that sequestered, if you like. Um, so, so I think those conversations have been had. Nevertheless, there is something about greening, I think, and, and about how we look at our city centres going forward that has to be incorporated into the way that we, um, the way that we plan them. Um, so I think that will be very much a part of the master plan work going forward. Councillor Rippingale. So just to come back on that point, um, there is space at the top of Brook Street that's owned by highways that could be used to put some form of tree or um, so we recently looked at the who the land ownership down there, just at the top of the sawmill estate, just because of the work we were doing there. And it, it wouldn't be a huge impact, but it would one make the area look slightly nicer and stop people putting blue bins on there mm -hmm. um, and to you know provide an opportunity to bring some greening into a crossroads even if it's a couple of trees um, and that land is owned by highways it was confirmed by planning so there is an opportunity potentially there to engage with some some greening project thanks councillor Rippingdale. i think i think we can um speak to um highways about that one and, but i think rosa as well with her greening projects i think with that that hat on might be useful to bring her in and have a conversation around that and what that program looks like and the impact of it okay um so just on the clean air um initiatives does Essex Highways have any responsibility here or does it all come down to the authority that has environmental health? <laughs> so currently air quality sits with the borough authority. Um, it, it, the yeah, it, it comes to us. However, the environment bill um, that's coming um, that we haven't had the detail of. It's been dis delayed because apparently the, re the consultation response was so great, government have delayed it, does give um, Essex um, more of a duty to work collaboratively with us. Um, and actually, funny enough, I got an email today inviting me to a meeting um, because Essex are putting together an air quality strategy for the whole of Essex. And because we've got an air quality management area, we are one of the people, one of the authorities invited. So um, I think perhaps historically, maybe not as much as we would have liked. We'd have to you know, really encourage it, but it seems like they're coming to us now to get involved. And uh, we did have a, another bid, which is a DEFRA bid, which is aside from all this great work, I did another one with Essex County Council, and there's some air quality sensors in the borough as well, measuring um, nitrogen dioxide and one doing particulates in Brook Street. That was a bit delayed, again, lampposts and things, but it's, it's there. And the results from that are, are really interesting. And they are, 
They just seem to be in a better place to work with us on the new air quality action plan that we're, we're starting to put together again now. So it's a really good question in as much as actually it, it, things seem to have changed um, with regard to the County Council and their interest in air quality. That's good. I mean, if you look at the issues with, say, the bottom of Mersey Road, Brook Street, a lot of them would come to highway engineering issues or whether we were brave enough to put bus gates in, for example, that would reduce the traffic significantly. Um, but that's up to highways to do. But it's good that they have an onus now or moving forward. If the environmental bill goes forward or ever comes to pass, you never know with government at the moment. Um, OK, any other questions on this unique piece of work? Cool. OK, as some of you will probably remember, we raised the issue of um, tackling idling outside schools and looking at more of a stick approach. Um, so I think that's coming to us in either January or February. So that is still coming. This is just a different bit of work around um, the funding that we got from DEFRA, but all really good stuff. So uh, on this, we just to note. So we sent quite a few comments um, and some really good stuff uh, moving forward. OK, so that moves us to item nine which uh, takes us back to Ben, I believe, so Climate Emergency Action Plan update. Hey, yes, so this is um, an item just updating on a few uh, sort of highlights of the action plan within the last month or so that we thought would be good to bring to councillors' attention. Um, so they're all listed in the report, but I wanted to bring out a few specifically. Um, so one of them is on the uh, work being done by the planning policy team, planning policy, yeah, that's right, um, on the creation of free supplementary planning documents um, that will help to interpret the adopted local plan. Um, and these three relate to sustainability. So there's one on active travel, one on biodiversity, and one on climate change in relation to developments. Um, so essentially what they will um, outline is sort of best practice guidance on how to consider um, all of these three elements within um, developments and it's what um, the team has been working on with officers and, and that's coming to the local plan committee at the start of next year. Um, I was told to bring it along specifically today um, in case members wanted to submit anything sort of ideas and sort of best practice that they knew about that they'd like considered in the um, SPDs before they are brought to the local plan committee in January. Um, and then before they go out to wider consultation as well. Um, appreciate you haven't actually got the SPDs to look at here, so you don't know what we've included, but um, if you have got any ideas, then you can just sort of send them on to us afterwards or raise them now. Um, a couple of other um, bits. Um, so just launched in time for Christmas is the um, eCargo bike um, delivery service uh, operating um, from the city centre, um, where you'll be able to do your shopping in the city centre um, and have it uh, take you'll take it to a hub just opposite where the Sainsbury's um, is on Priory Walk. Um, you can drop it there. You can then enjoy the city centre without your shopping. Go um, out to restaurants, cinema, whatever. Enjoy the festivities and have the shop. Being, um, delivered to your home either the same day or in the next day or two um, yeah without having to worry about your shopping so it's a really interesting um, initiative being piloted and I hope um, some people will take it up which is really interesting um, and the other one I was going to also mention that's been quite exciting has been going on on our communications channels is the launch of the uh, electric vehicle car club um, we've got the first car in Priory Street car park now it's been used and the hope is working with enterprise that that will expand over time as sort of car clubs are being planned into developments and we've also got another car that can go in um, as well when we've found a suitable location. Um, there's obviously other updates in the report as well. I'm happy to take comments on those or anything else that people would like to hear an update on. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, just on the e-cargo um, delivery idea which is really radical actually um, it'd be great if we could get some really good comms on that and that could be sent to all councillors to start pushing that I think 
that could be something really unique because something we get when I ever say to residents, they moan about traffic. I say, well, you could walk or cycle. You, you don't live that far. They go, how am I supposed to get my shopping home? Um, and being honest, most people don't buy bulky stuff anyway, but if they do, there's that option there with the cargo. So I think that is a, that's a way of getting rid of that excuse where people moan about the high parking and so forth. Uh, Councillor Rippingale. So thank you for the contents of this report. It's really interesting. In terms of the electric car club, um, I would like to propose a site that you looked at at Port Lane. Given that um, the car park is underutilised as it is, we have a high transient rental population who probably struggle to get things to tips or just generally anywhere. Um, and also that the because GO4 is becoming like an... Uh, a cargo bike hub it would be a really nice link up um, i just think there's a lot of opportunity for people there who don't necessarily own a set own a car um, and like i said the car parts are underutilized anyway it could provide an ex a new opportunity or incentive for people to come to the reg or use that that car um, so i'd like to put that forward for consideration please um, I'll answer that one if you want, because uh, Car Club's my project. Um, another DEFRA funded one that we'll report back on in January. But yeah, um, I think it's definitely a good location. Um, I need to check, but we did suggest that one was built into the Paxman developments. Um, I need to see whether what's the status of that at the moment. Obviously, that's not as short term um, might be a little bit uh, away. Um, basically, the, the, the initial two um, we've said will be in the city centre so then the idea is that we work with communities again to see where there's demand um, and increase the network working with enterprise so yeah definitely we'll keep that in mind thank you so i've got council laws and council barber uh, well done again the car club is obviously an amazing idea i mean cars seem to spend most of their time parked don't they not actually used which is a massive and inefficient use of premium urban space in particular um, I appreciate what you said about the, the SPDs, um, and I'm ignorant because I'm a substitute here tonight, but I just wondered, is there going to be anything around um, fake plastic grass? Because I hate it. It's terrible for biodiversity and terrible for drainage. And is there anything, and probably this is a bigger one for any of us, is there anything being looked at in terms of the ever erosion of front gardens for more um, parking? Because again, that impacts on drainage. We know in particular, don't we, around Crap Cowdery Avenue? Where there are properties that, that suffer from flooding uh, at peak times um, but then all of those properties have given up their front gardens for uh, car parks so i just wondered if um, that was something in the mix but fake plastic grass big no no yeah certainly agree on um on those um i think they will be um so for example on the on the plastic grass and also linking with the with the parking point obviously as you mentioned those reduce drainage and lead to sort of service runoff of water and those issues so I think the planning team are quite uh, hot on the sort of sustainable urban drainage system. So I very I don't know the context myself, but I very much expect that that will be in there as part of that considerations of avoiding impermeable services and that for developments will be considered. But I, I can definitely feed both of those points back and see if they're make sure they're in there. Councillor Barber and then Councillor Kirby Taylor. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, Ben, for the update. Really good stuff, particularly around the car club and the um, the cargo bar concierge. And I agree with Councillor Scordis about the comms on the concierge service. Uh, I think that's a really good feature. I mean, set aside the e-cargo side of things, just having the concierge service alone is a pretty unique feature. And in fact, it's vitally friendly all the better. So I, I really support um, doing some strong comms on that. I'm sure we done some but even more so uh, on the supplementary planning document it, if i could maybe fire across a couple of ideas which i'm not sure whether this would be within our remit or a gs council but certainly having uh, a policy where we support uh, 20 mile per hour as a as a, as a must have in in new developments um, i think that's really important uh, as, a, as a policy but also secure cycle storage in any areas where, for instance, apartment block developments or new commercial premises. I think it's really important that the secure cycle storage is a key aspect of a development because I've seen developments where you get the you get the travel plan is produced uh, by the developer and really 
we all know there's not enough space in that particular development for people to store their bikes because it, it's difficult for them. So, but there's plenty of car parking spaces. So I think that uh, I think I'd really like to see some strong secure storage because often when you speak to people about one reason why they don't cycle places is because they struggle to find somewhere secure for their bike perceived or otherwise they don't feel it's safe to secure their bike in in the center or, or elsewhere um, i just had my bike stolen so i know it's not particularly um and it wasn't in a secure location so it's sort of my own fault um but i think if we could do something around that I'd be, i think that'd be really worthwhile thank you yeah, just to say those suggestions will be taken on and passed on. Councillor Kirkby Taylor. Um, just want to say again, as everybody else, thank you for this. Uh, the idea of a car club is something that we've been wanting to, to work out how to start pushing for for quite some time. Um, so it's nice to hear we've actually been beaten to the punch for that. That's, uh, uh, thank you on that. Um, for the SPDs, um, has there been any um, inclusion regarding alternative building technologies, so limecrete, hempcrete, um, hydraulic lime-based mortars, or other inherently low-carbon alternatives uh, to replace the traditional use of Portland cement? Because um, if we can start thinking about decarbonisation as, as more than things like heat pumps and PV, we can um push to shift into the the reba one and two design process and if, if we can start putting it earlier we we can get much bigger gains um, and much better outcomes um also given the recent price increases in steel um can we look to promote timber frames where where suitable um because again lower carbon um really quite good um financial benefits as well as environmental benefits and much lower uh carbon for transport because most of the steel as we know is is no longer manufactured in this country so you, you're winning out on the carbon there as well um also are we including any kind of minimum bream ratings and if so what are we aiming for because i'd love to say we should aim for outstanding um but you know that's never going to happen um excellent would be great and but but i think we have to to really push for very good or um or excellent if possible yeah just to come back um i don't know about the alternative building technologies and the materials i will ask um planning policy about whether that's going to be included um or not um similarly with the timber frames on the on the briam um, I know it's something that they were were deciding on the standard they were going to include. Um, so there was a separate um, standard produced by, uh, I've got to remember the, I know the acronym, but I don't know what it stands for. Um, they were called, let me just get there. So the acronym is LETI. I don't know if you've heard of them at all. Um, but they're, I was reading off their website, a network of over 1000 built environment professionals. Um, they produced a net zero design guide standard for building to um, energy use intensity standards that were pretty low and were sort of recognized and recommended to us by um, the Climate Action Planning Unit at Essex. I don't know if, I, if a final decision got made and whether we we're going to use those or BRIAM because I think We'd had Briam very good previously, um, but I don't know what decision was made, but I can follow that up and see what concluded. Yes, please. Uh, how do you, uh, what's the spelling on Letty? Uh, L-E-T-I. I'll look that up, thank you. Um, I was just gonna just talk about the process for the SPDs, just in terms of where next well, i think it was just to take some initial feedback on what could be in them but they go through local plan committee so um i think some early engagement has taken place just with uh, members which the panel were invited to yeah um already and and there's been some focused engagement through a questionnaire just on the sort of scoping elements of it um and as, as drafts are prepared there will be further engagement with the panel and with the public as well so it will go through that process um 
and uh, a, a much wider public consultation. So there will be the, the way of feeding back into these as well. This is just to say that they're happening and if there's any initial conversations that we want to have here to feed back. So I think they're all really useful suggestions and we'll definitely feed those back to the planning policy team for their work going forward. Uh, Council Boris. Thank you. Um, a few, oh, sorry. Um, a little while ago, I think there was some discussion. I think Mandy, it was on the tour of the town that we did about secure bike parking off Sir Isaac's Walk. Was that with you? Um, so just picking up on the point about secure bike parking, how's that going? What's the situation with it, please? I'm going to bring um, either Emily or Ben in on that one because I think they they know the. I think Emily, she's looking like she knows when it's going to open. So I think it's imminent, but I'm not quite sure what that means. I think all the long awaited leases and contracts, etc., are literally being signed as we speak. And then um, there is a period of time for fit out. So I would imagine it will be sometime early in the new year. Okay. Uh, any other points to add? As Ben says, you can feed into him any ideas for the SPDs. Um, a few of us did attend a meeting about it as well. And to be honest, they covered most of the bases. Um, so, but it's still worth getting things in if you're not sure. Um, or you can always liaise with Karen and Sandra, Scott, who've been dealing with that as well, um, who can give you more detail. Uh, but any other points? No, okay, excellent. Thank you as ever, Ben. And then that just takes us to the work program. So we have two set meetings um, until the next set of elections. Uh, so 31st of Jan, we're looking at active travel and electric vehicles updates. Um, and I think that might be where we look at the um, possible finding of engine idling as well in that section. Um, and another update from Ben, and then we're looking at uh, on the 21st of March, the waste and recycling strategy update. Um, I think we need to hear more back about these workshops as well, because we were told we were going to do workshops on the um, on the waste strategy as that gets updated as well. Um, and then the summary of the year. Um, any other ideas people want to add or want to wait till New Year and uh, and get to the football quickly? There we go. They, uh, the silent answer is everyone wants to go to watch football. Uh, brilliant. Okay, I will close the meeting there. Thank you everyone for watching and attending. <laughs>